So I don't know how many seconds is left, but. Welcome to this, our 33rd episode of Apex Instant Tips, coming to you live every Friday at 12.05 Eastern Time uh, for five minutes only from Massachusetts. My name is Hayden. And I'm Anton. And Hayden, I'm really excited this week. Um, we, uh, one of our, perhaps our only, devoted listener, uh, <laughs> uh, asked a question in the comments, suggested a tip topic. Uh, so I say we jump right on that. Let's do it. Um, our, uh, I'll call him out by name, Kyron D. Um, this is an answer to your request for a tip for migrating Apex applications. So we've done our best. Uh, and I will say uh, migrating could have a couple of different meanings. Um, it could mean upgrading, it could mean, but we've taken it to mean that uh, deploying your application, moving it, for example, from dev to production, or, or you've got a, an application that you want to distribute to you know, 100 different uh, companies, people that are going to use this application. So we've taken it to mean deploying your application uh, and installing it. Uh, right. And of course, installing the application itself is pretty straightforward, but it's all those supporting objects, tables, packages, views, sequences that uh, really make the make for the complexity of, of uh, deploying an application. And so, so, so here I am sharing my screen and uh, everyone is familiar with this particular view of the application. Uh, I will go ahead and start my timer. My timer's not visible on the screen, but you can take my word for it that we are in fact counting down five minutes. So, Hi, Jade. <laughs> uh, as you said, Anton, I'll navigate to supporting objects and we can take a look at what we've prepared for you for this demo. And so I, I see that we have um, a build option and five installation scripts. Right, and I think five is one more than we were supposed to have. We created one and neglected to delete it. So we're ah. gonna sneak in there and use up uh, a moment of our time to delete one of the installation scripts. Yeah, let, let's, let's demo recreating this. So yeah, so we're gonna delete. So what we've got here is we have four installation scripts. Four um, installation scripts. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you can see I, I tend to break my, you could do all of this in one giant installation script, but I like to break it into sequences, package specs, tables, views, package bodies. Um, sometimes you'll have other components as well, but that tends to be uh, a good start anyway. Sequences, package specs, tables, views, and then package bodies. Obviously, we don't have views in here yet. We've recently added the need for a view to our application. So we're That's going to create yeah, and we're going to create it directly from the database object. We'll let the database determine what the script is. So we can just call this views. We're going to change the sequence to 35 because we want to sneak it in between the other two. And we'll pick view. Um, and the view that we've defined is related to AIT 33, this uh, show. So we can filter right on that AIT 33 or just take it. Um, so we do that. And that's the view we want. So push that over. And it's really just that easy. The database figures out that this is the view. It creates the script for us. We have to make sure we click create there. That's a, a key element. Uh, and there you can see is. we now have our views. Um, I've done that with all of these. If you click on the edit for the tables, we'll see that the tables were all created from database objects as well. There's a list of database objects, channels, customers, products. The, customer, uh, the customers you can see as first name, last name, email, city, country, gender, date of birth. Um, Anton, uh, I, I hear you say first name, last name, but I see, in fact, first name, list name. Now, that would actually be quite embarrassing. Clearly, our data model has a problem. We we would want to change the, we want to fix this, right? So let's go to the, the to the uh, object browser and get this thing fixed. Um, so we're going to fix uh, our customer's table, and we're going to rename the column to last name. Hey, Hayden, I can't believe that's uh, slipped us in all of our vast testing, but- Of course, uh, no, this obviously <laughs> is not part of the demo. <laughs> um, so there we go. So now we fix that. We probably we may have to fix it in some packages and other places as well, but um, we've at least fixed it here. We, and if we go back to this application and take a look at our supporting objects, um, we'll see that the supporting object has not changed. But what we get is right there in the status column, it says the object definition has changed. Right, so and, let me navigate yeah. back here first. Yes, right. so I see may need refresh here in the status. Right, so your supporting objects has recognized and is prompting you that, hey, you need to refresh this. So you can simply uh, click checkbox there and click refresh check, and you now have a refreshed object, and there you and we go. we have uh, two minutes to go. Two minutes to go, great. So um, if we were to look at that script, we'll see that it now has last name 
Um, so it's a, it's a very easy way to maintain your uh, the, the objects that are required to be deployed with your application. And then when you export the application, all these scripts come with it. When you import the application, it says, do you want to install supporting objects? Why don't we take a look at when what happens when you do that? It, it prompts you with a bunch of messages that you also have control over. So you have the ability to give uh, a message. You can have a, a license if you want to have them click through and accept a license. Um, you can change your application substitutions. There's a lot you can do just through these messages. One of my favorite yeah, things. This seems like a, um, a really strong way to, I would say, idiot-proof installation. Um, <laughs> there's a reason why all of the uh, packaged um, applications from the Apex Gallery use the same methodology for installing and supporting objects. That's right. And it's it's definitely a great way to go is to use supporting objects for deploying either in your own, you know, departmental or business uh, or or sending it out to, you know, hundreds of different organizations that might use the one application. One of the things I really like on, is under supporting objects is the ability to prompt the users to look at build settings. Um, so if you go to supporting objects again and take a look at the build settings, we actually have a build on this application. And the build is, do we want to include activity reporting. So if the person installing the application wants this feature, it um, it uh, could be a build feature and you can turn it on and off at during install. Um, and that's uh, 15 seconds to go. So, uh, so I think that covers uh, what it. are your final words on this, Simon? Uh, um, my uh, final words are some of these scripts also belong in your repository, perhaps all of them in your subversion or Git uh, repository, but um, that's a whole other concept. So and we'll that is it for time. Oh, so so uh, I will, uh, true to, to our word, um, I will stop sharing our, my screen. And uh, for, for those of you who just stuck around for five minutes, I, I welcome you to uh, say your goodbyes, uh, like, subscribe on your way out. But you are welcome to uh, leave us at this point. We have a, a wisdom of the week. And we have uh, a discussion period um, that Anton, I hope you'll stick around for. And then finally, uh, there is an off-topic tip that is a surprise to me. Ah, yes, and I'm kind of excited. I'm not sure if I've ever shared this with this tip with you, Hayden. So we'll find out when I do today. Um, yes. So, uh, and we do appreciate those comments. If you have something uh, either today or or you want to put them in the the chats later, we'll uh, we'll take a look. Maybe we can answer a uh, a tip for you. Um, yes. Hayden, I see we have a few. Oh, well, we, why don't we do the Wisdom of the Week first? Yes. Yeah, so uh, today's Wisdom of the Week is um, uh, a comic that I found on Reddit. It, it, it struck close to home for me. Uh, I, I recently deployed something in production that broke. Um, it, there is a hubris to uh, uh, neglecting to write your test. So this is a reminder to everyone, be sure to write tests if you are deploying something to production. And, and I'll admit that I'm, uh, I'm extra surprised to hear that Hayden had uh, something that broke in production because I find that when Hayden is on any of our projects, uh, he brings a level of interest to testing that improves all of our, our methodologies and our approaches. Um, Hayden, as yes. he said, it really is true to his nature, uh, the, the idea of testing. And, and perhaps this Wisdom of the Week is in fact a teaser for future tips. Uh, yes, I think uh, testing Apex applications would be a great tip. Um, it might take 10 or 15 five-minute tips, but uh, a certainly <laughs> good start. <laughs> um, so uh, I've used object through database link in your app, right? So uh, that's a good point. Um, the, the objects that you are able to select um, are local uh, to your database um, for if you're doing a create from database object, but you can... Um, you can do um, di you can do scripts that aren't created from database objects. But that said, I've never tried to create a database object through a database link. So I I think that if you're using if you're using external resources um, tables through a database link, or for example, a web service that's somewhere else, you're not going to be able to create the web service in a different database through a script. Well, I suppose there's always these possibilities, right? You could have um, a script that calls a web service that creates a web service or a script that calls a web service that creates a database object. I mean, but <laughs> yes, the, the short answer is right. If it's through a database link or some external resource, you're not going to be able to create those through, through supporting objects. Um, let's see. One uh, feature of um, uh, supporting objects that we didn't get around to demoing, but hopefully we can do it for another tip is uh, upgrade scripts. 
Yes, um, upgrade scripts and I think that's a great topic. Um, other components of supporting objects, what we really touched on was installation scripts. And there are other aspects, installation, upgrade, uh, removing delete scripts. All of those are um, uh, great, great thing, parts of supporting objects. Um, uh, and there, I have different techniques as to how I use upgrade. I, I actually use upgrades for a very specific use case. I actually use the install scripts even as upgrade scripts, but that's a teaser, as we said. Um, and I see a completely off topic tip, I think here. Um, and so I I think uh, we should see what we can do in 30 seconds or so on this one. Uh, it's from Jade Hart. Uh, is it possible to set server side conditions for dynamic actions and validations in Apex by just querying and updating the Apex metadata? It is absolutely possible to query the apex metadata um, updating the apex metadata can be done if your application at the application level there are checkboxes that allow you to uh, uh, that say whether the application can update its own metadata or update the metadata of other applications but in those scenarios you can only update metadata that has an apex api that allows you to update the metadata did, did, did that make sense? It made sense to me. Okay. I thought so, that's a good answer. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Um, so, um, I, if it's possible. Yes. So, uh, for, for those of you who are um, uh, a little hazy on the experience of using supporting objects, uh, I, I encourage you to check out the uh, the gallery of uh, prepackaged apps from the Apex team. So those are the best in class examples of what it means to install, upgrade, deinstall um, Apex applications. Yeah, and I'm going to rewind just a moment to the question about uh, from Jade. Um, I will caution you to only use things like colon app ID and not hard code. One two three four as your app ID when you're querying metadata. Also, don't use the actual ID of any underlying element. Use the static reference if you have a static reference. So if you if you need to check something about um, a, a, a build option or a, a, something on a region or whatever it might be, don't reference the underlying ID because those can change as you migrate from dev to tester to other environments. Um, Migrating is uh, full of pitfalls. Yes, yes. Um, so, which is, of course, why we had today's topic even uh, asked about. Um, yes, and no doubt more topics to come on the same subject. It's yes. a big topic. So, I guess we've already had one off-topic tip, but I have to say, I'm really excited about the off-topic tip that I'm about to um, segue into. I'm on the <laughs> edge of my seat. I've I've known about this tip for over thirty years. Um, uh, my wife and I used to use this tip uh, when we were in college. So Hayden, it's possible you already know this, but for those of you that um, want to try this at home, um, I, I suggest you know, um, you know, absolutely going out and getting yourself some chocolate covered graham crackers. These with sea salt, quite nice, but they don't have to be. They don't have to be the small, any size chocolate covered graham cracker will work. Um, and what you wanna do is you wanna take your chocolate covered graham cracker. This tiny okay. little one is fine. Hayden, are you familiar with this? No. No, oh, I can't believe yeah. I've never shown you this. We've been friends for so long. So, <laughs> um, please don't be mad. Please don't be mad that uh, that I've never shown you this before. I am showing it to you now, so better late than never. So what you wanna do, you wanna take your graham cracker, you wanna take the smallest possible bite off the corner. Mm, that's actually maybe a little bigger than you need, um, Okay. but just the tiniest, little, just barely a scratch. Yeah, there you see it. Um, and yes. then, Diagonally from that, bigger graham crackers are quite nice as well. Do it another tiny little scratch. Mm -hmm. Again, both of those are bigger than they need to be. And then you get yourself a glass of milk, right? And you use it as a straw. I know this tip, yes. <laughs> you have shared this to me. <laughs> and then that is just about the best thing you can eat. Mm. Mm. So. No, I, um, I, I'm surprised that I, that somehow slips my memory. That is a, a powerful um, tip. So um, I will say, 
It is certainly possible to make your own chocolate covered graham crackers if you can't find them locally. Um, but make sure that they get uh, well covered because you don't want any holes in there because you won't get a good straw effect out of it. Yeah, you need that good section. Excellent. Well, I'm going to stop talking and keep chewing. Yes. Well, I, I think it's it, that is a perfect end to the episode. Um, it is uh, lunchtime for many of our viewers, and uh, I, I think it's a um, a good way to wet people's appetite. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. So do all the things. Send letters to your friends. Um, go to the grocery store right now. Yes. Like, subscribe. <laughs> Take care, everybody. See you next Friday. Bye-bye.